Greetings, and welcome to the September 19th service of the Unitarian Church of Los Alamos. Whoever you are, whomever you love, wherever you are on your life's journey, you are so welcome here. My name is Sue Watts, and I'll be your worship associate for the day. Since our minister, the Reverend John Cullinan, continues his sabbatical, we welcome Jenny Amstutz, formerly known as Jenny McCready. She is delighted to return to our pulpit from her remote teach preaching spot at the Col Columbine Unitarian Universalist Church of Littleton, Colorado, where she is currently serving as the minister. Jenny has had an eventful year, graduating from Meadville Lombard Theological School, turning 50, and getting married to Jason. She will return to our pulpit once again in October, and she hopes to be ordained in the new year. So welcome back, Jenny, and welcome to you all. We're so glad you could all join us.
Good morning, my friends in Los Alamos. I am Jenny Amstutz, formerly Jenny McCready, an occasional visitor to your pulpit. I'm delighted to be with you here today, recording from the sanctuary of Columbine Unitarian Universalist Church here in Littleton, Colorado, where I am privileged to serve as their new minister. Today, I would like to explore with you a medieval mystic. Hildegard von Bingen, a woman whose spiritual journey left us so much riches here centuries later. But first, I invite you to join me as we enter a space of worship together. Let us take a breath and notice the life that dwells within us and the connections that we feel to each other and to the natural world. We are called into worship this morning with the words of Hildegard von Bingen written nearly 800 years ago. Fire of the spirit. Life of the lives of creatures. Spiral of sanctity. Bond of all natures. Glow of charity. Lights of clarity. Taste of sweetness to the fallen. Be with us and hear us, composer of all things, joy in the glory, strong honor. Be with us and hear us. Come, let us worship together. Gaudé amus, gaudé amus, gaudé amus, odie. Gaudé amus, gaudé amus, odie. Gaudé amus, gaudé amus, gaudé amus, odie. Gaudé amus, gaudé amus, odie. Our affirmation pulls our congregation together and unites us with others in the broader Unitarian Universalist community by defining the core of our shared beliefs. I invite you to join us in speaking these words of affirmation. Love is the doctrine of this church. The quest for truth is its sacrament and service is its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge and freedom, to serve life and fellowship, to the end that all souls shall grow in harmony. Thus do we covenant with each and with all. No words have been written in our virtual book of joys and sorrows. So let us take a moment now, as candles burn in our sanctuary, to bring to our minds and hearts whatever we are feeling today. In this time of silence, let us lift up our brokenness and our wholeness, the endings and the beginnings, and the beauty and struggles of our lives, knowing that together we can be instruments of peace and hope and love. As we gather here today, weary from over a year and a half of being physically apart, we remember that we have a shared faith. 
you use in Colorado and New Mexico and throughout our country and our world share ritual and worship and history and values that call us into service and kindle our hope. As we take a moment and let us breathe into this time together, let us remember to hold each other in gratitude and in care as we navigate this uncertain and unprecedented time. I invite you to listen to the words of Hildegard that are still ringing true. Walk through the valley of humility and know peace. Lose your titanic, hard to satisfy ego. A greedy self-esteem is just a steep mountain you will find dangerous to climb. It's also tricky, if not impossible, to come down from some such heights. And anyhow, the summit is too small for community. Focus on love's splendid garden instead. Gather the flowers of humility and simplicity of soul. Study God's patience. Keep your eyes open. Amen. Today, I want to share with you a story about a special woman's life. She was born over almost 900 years ago. She was a nun in Germany, someone from the Christian faith, and lived her life according to her beliefs. As Unitarian Universalists, the stories and lessons we learn from come from these beautiful six sources of our faith. The sense of wonder we all share. Women and men, long ago and today, peoples whose lives remind us to be kind and fair. The ethical and spiritual wisdom of the world's religions. Christian and Jewish teachings, which tell us to love others as we love ourselves. The use of reason and the discoveries of science. The harmony of nature and the sacred circle of life. I love our sources. We do not need to agree with everything they say, but we can hold on to the lessons they teach us. Let's learn more today in our story. Hildegard of Bingen, scientist, composer, healer, and saint. Author and illustrator, Demi. Once there was a time way back in the year of 1098, over 900 years ago, a little girl was born named Hildegard in Mainz, Germany. She was a very special girl because when she shut her eyes, she saw lights. And inside those lights, she could imagine heaven. She believed that the light inside her mind helped her see things differently. If she looked at a mother cow, she could imagine the color of its calf before it was born. And she was usually right. 
She also had strong feelings and imagined what might happen in the future. But these feelings and the strength in which they came gave her terrible headaches. Her parents decided to send her to the Benedictine cloister of Mount Disabod, where they could watch over her. This monastery was on a beautiful mountain illuminated by the sun. It was a place where people learned about God and would go to pray. Hildegard learned how to read, play music, sing, study history, prayer, spinning, and worked at the cloister where the nuns live. She was so musical that she could hear the singing of an entire prayer service just once and perform it. She was remembered saying, There is the music of heaven in all things, and we have just forgotten how to hear it until we sing it. When Hildegard was 18, she became a nun and took the Benedictine habit. She was so wise and so kind that when she was older, Hildegard was elected abbess of the cloister. But even as she grew older, when Hildegard shut her eyes and had her big feelings, her headaches still became so great that she could hardly bear the pain. One day, when she was praying, she finally had a sense of peace in her big feelings. She began to see her own light as a light of God, and it was her job to let her inside light shine out to the world. And so Hildegard began to share all of her big feelings to a nun and monk who wrote them down in a book called Know the Ways of God. Hildegard's wisdom showed how to live a pathway to a life full of light and love. When she shared about her big feelings and light with others, her headaches went away. But Hildegard didn't feel she was important enough to share this wisdom. Who would listen to her? She thought, I am just a poor little woman. I am just a tiny feather in this great big world. The greatest monk of time of the time, Bernard of Clairvaux, told her to continue sharing her wisdom, and so did Pope Eugenius III. When Hildegard was 53, she finished her book, Know the Ways of God, and she became famous. Now everyone wanted to see her at St. Disabod Cloister, but it wasn't big enough. Hildegard thought hard and meditated and prayed and decided to move her nuns to Rupertsburg near the town of Bingen, and she became known as Hildegard of Bingen. At age 65, Hildegard finished her second book, The Book of Life's Merits, Teaching Ways to Love, Forgive, and Be at Peace. Hildegard and the nuns helped heal people's sickness from the wisdom of science at the time and comfort them with prayer. Hildegard went on to write five more books, and one of them was even a cookbook. Hildegard felt so connected to love and light that helped her compose 77 symphonic songs and a play about how to live the teachings of the Bible. She wrote letters to everyone she knew and even didn't know, like important leaders, emperors, popes, bishops, and royalty. She even invented an alphabet and created a whole new language. In her 60s and 70s, Hildegard shared her teachings and wisdom throughout Germany. At the age of 81, Hildegard died on September 17, 1179, 842 years ago. Her life is honored by many Christians who celebrate her and everything she gave to the world, including her courage to share her light and love.
My goodness, Hildegard lived a full and beautiful life. When I first read her story, I was very curious about her light. You know, some Unitarian Universalists believe that we all have a light, a spark of beauty, wonder, something amazing within all of us. When I read about Hildegard and her light, that is what I thought of, a spark of light and love that we can share with others just like Hildegard did. She believed it was God and heaven that gave her this spark and that she was meant to share that light, that spark with everyone around her. Maybe we can learn from her life that we all have a spark. Maybe that light is how we share our our love with others, the friends we help, or the beauty we discover every day. I wonder, what does your spark look like? Is it bright? and shiny, or maybe it is blue and comforting. I wonder, how do you use your spark? Maybe it is sharing kindness or love with others, or helping friends or your family, or caring for animals or taking care of the earth. Blessing and love to you and your families, and the light you shine in this world. I am that great and fiery force Sparkling in everything that lives In shining of the river's course In greening grass that glory gives I shine in glitter on the seas, in burning sun, in moon and stars, in unseen wind, in verdant trees. I breathe within both near and far. no death, and meadows glow with beauties rife. I am in all the Spirit's breath, the thundered word for I am love. Our reading today is an excerpt from the book Hildegard von Bingen wrote called Skivius. She said, don't let yourself forget that God's grace rewards not only those who never slip, but those who bend and fall. So sing the song of rejoicing softens hard hearts. It makes tears of godly sorrow flow from them. Singing summons the Holy Spirit. Happy praises offered in simplicity and love lead the faithful to complete harmony without discord. 
don't stop singing. Like our call to worship in our reading today, Hildegard von Bingen's words are all encompassing, calling us to a wider and deeper understanding of the divine. She wrote, Oh, Sophia, you encircle circling, understanding, comprehending everything. Your loving wisdom flows like the sap in the trees, nourishing life with the food of truth uniting all on a living spiral pathway. Hildegard's legacy of musical compositions, preaching, art, writing, herbal and medicinal knowledge, religious naturalism, and deep mysticism is not well known in our modern world. But her spiritual explorations and her words still have much to teach us today. Today, I would like to share her incredible story with you. She was born in the Rhineland of what is now Germany to a noble family. Her father was a knight and she was the youngest of 10 children. She was often ill as a child and from the time she was about three years old, she suffered from terrible headaches. When she was eight years old, her parents offered her as a sort of tithe to the church which this was a common practice for noble families in those times. She was placed in the care of the local hermitage where she served as the handmaid to a 15-year-old girl named Yetta. Yetta had also come from a noble family and had chosen to live the aesthetic life of a recluse in the hermitage. Yetta and Hildegard were isolated together and Yetta taught Hildegard to read and write to play and even to pray and even to play music. As time went on, more girls and women joined the spiritual community and along with the Benedictine monks, it became a nunnery with Yetta as the abbess. When Hildegard was 15, she took her vows to become a nun. And when she was 38, Yetta died. Hildegard was elected to succeed Yetta as the abbess. Now, Hildegard had always had visions since she was a little girl, but after she became abbess, her visions became more frequent and vivid, sometimes leaving her bedridden for weeks. She describes her visions in this way. In this affliction, I lay 30 days while my body burned as with fever. And throughout those days, I watched a procession of angels innumerable who fought alongside Michael against the dragon and won the victory. And one of them called out to me, Eagle, Eagle, why sleepest thou? Arise, for it is dawn, eat and drink. 
Instantly, Hildegard said, my body and my senses came back into the world, and seeing this, my fellow nuns who were weeping around me lifted me from the ground, placed me on my bed, and thus I began to get my strength back. Hildegard lived a long and incredible life, standing up to church leaders, following a revelation to leave the abbey to start her own, studying plants and medicine, ex exploring theology and philosophy, and writing extensively. She was ahead of her time as a musical composer, and her music is still studied extensively today. She was a fascinating and brilliant character and she emerged from a context where women were not educated or even allowed to speak. And yet Hildegard walked hundreds of miles on three preaching tours. It is truly miraculous that she was able to accomplish all that she did during her long life. She lived 83 years, which in medieval times was practically unheard of. She has been called an ecumenical mystic because her re revelations tapped into symbols from other traditions, Celtic symbols that she may have been exposed to, but also symbols from traditions she could not have possibly had any earthly contact with at the time, such as Buddhist, Hindu, Aztec, and Hopi. It is a mystery as to why she was able to have visions which included such things. When I look at the six sources of our Unitarian Universalist faith, it's, in, it's interesting because Hildegard actually drew from all of these sources. Direct experience of wonder and awe, words and deeds of prophets, wisdom where it is found in different religious traditions, Jewish and Christian teachings, of course, she was a Catholic nun, humanist teachings, and spiritual teachings of the earth-centered traditions. She drew from her wonder and awe. She shared her prophetic words and deeds and confronted injustice. She was ecumenical and faithful to Catholic and Christian teachings. Hildegard used reason and science, and she connected her spirituality to the natural world. She was eclectic in her spiritual explorations, reminding me of this quote by a UU minister, the Reverend Kathleen, Kathleen Rowlands, who said, throughout history, we have moved to the rhythms of mystery and wonder, prophecy, wisdom, teachings from ancient and modern sources, and nature herself. The work of Hildegard that fascinates me the most is her teaching that nature is a revelation of God. She was the first Christian 200 years before Thomas Aquinas to claim that revelation came not just from sacred texts, but also from nature. Her teachings celebrated the sacred circle of life with instructions to live in the harmony and rhythms of nature. She left us with many artistic renditions of her cosmic visions, including this mandala. Called on the articulation of the body, it represents the tree of life in the universal cosmos and the seasons of human life throughout the seasons of the year. The imagery includes the breath of life, the winds of the cosmos, the music of the spheres, and connection to the natural world. You can see her in the lower left-hand corner recording this vision. Now I'm going to show you a close-up of the center of that mandala, highlighting the seasons of a person's life, cultivating and harvesting, and living within the cycles of the natural world.
Her book of natural healing was called Physica. And it begins the work with the words, with earth was the human being created. All the elements served mankind and sensing that man was alive, they busied themselves in aiding his life in every way. And man in turn occupied himself with them. The earth gave its vital energy and through the beneficial herb, the earth brings forth the range of mankind's spiritual powers. Hildegard's imagery of vines and leaves, rich soil and flourishing fruit were no doubt inspired by the lush green river valleys where she spent her life. She was a religious naturalist, coining the word veriditas or greening power to describe the healing and restorative powers of the earth. Her biographer, the white Episcopal priest named Matthew Fox, who I believe actually might live in New Mexico, he understands Veriditas to be, quote, God's freshness that humans receive in their spiritual and physical life forces. Veriditas is the power of springtime, a germinating force, a fruitfulness that comes from God and permeates all of creation. And Fox sees it as a blessing. Hildegard writes of the exquisite greening of trees and grasses and refers to God as a great underground river. Hildegard's theology often notes this constant interplay of the human person as a microcosm, both physically and spiritually within the macrocosm of the universe. And while it's been really interesting to learn about someone as unusual as Hildegard, she also calls us to answer some deeper questions. A very interesting thing happened while I was studying Hildegard. I thought this sermon would be about UU sources and how Hildegard resonated with each of those sources. I expected to kind of claim Hildegard for our own the way we UUs do. We like to claim people, sometimes they aren't really even UUs. But then, I was shocked when I actually read her words. I read some of Scivias, the book she wrote describing 26 visions she had and their, her interpretation of them. The book was a bestseller eight, 900 years ago, copied and distributed far and wide before the invention of the printing press, which was highly unusual for the time. Because of Scivias, women and girls came flocking to join Hildegard's Abbey. I eagerly read parts of it. It's a big book, over 500 pages. And I assumed that I would resonate with the whole book. After all, Hildegard was cool. <laughs> she resonates with my pagan roots, my feminism, my religious naturalism. I wanted to believe that Hildegard's mystic visions were a connection to some objectively true wisdom of the divine. I wanted to witness the underground streams of knowledge that run through all religious and spiritual traditions that Hildegard may have been tapping into. And I found beautiful writing, captivating visions, ideas that resonated with my mind and my heart and my being. But then I also found some pretty offensive ideas that rained on my parade, not like the medieval, not unlike the medieval church that she had given her life to. Her beliefs, especially around human sexuality, were homophobic and sexist and harmful. What did I expect, though? She lived in medieval times in a certain context and Hildegard von Bingen was a human being. I was disappointed in her, though. She let me down. I texted one of my colleagues, who's a big Hildegard fan, and I lamented that Hildegard's teachings on sexuality run so counter to my dearly held beliefs, and they are teachings that are still alive and well in our culture today, and they cause great harm. I realized that I had wanted Hildegard to be something that no human being is, a bearer of perfect wisdom, and her writings a source of absolute truth. 
That awareness of my own desire to finally see what God sees and have a glimpse into the truth with a capital T of the mystery of the universe with a capital M and a capital U became my biggest takeaway from my learning about Hildegard. She reminded me of all of our human desire to find ultimate truth. Even me, the strong agnostic, the one you'll hear preaching about being okay with not knowing the answers, all of us are, it seems to me, wired to look for a guru or a prophet or a faith that will guide us to salvation and solve our problems and take away the pain of not knowing. Some folks are so desirous of knowing the absolute truth that they find a theology and they stick to it and they insist this is the one way. I've lost some dear friends to that methodology and I'm sure you have too. But at the same time, it's important not to throw Hildegard out with the bathwater either. She has so much to teach us, so much to inspire us with, but we must be discerning. This spirituality business is complicated, and it's also simple. It's not all or nothing. We can read the Bible and other sacred texts with discernment. And sometimes we don't have to condone the personal behavior of some of our greatest theologians, like the Reverend Dr. King or Forest Church. We don't believe that revelation is sealed. And we don't believe that there is one source of wisdom. We navigate the world innately drawn to spiritual understanding and mystical experience. When we look for teachers to finally tell us the truth, what we find are imperfect people, imperfect theologies, imperfect doctrines, laced and woven in among some treasures of a story. Parents, teachers, ministers, friends, authors, professors, theologians, and of course ourselves, we are all fallible, even mystics. My mind is open to Hildegard's visions, having been inspired by holy oneness, by the divine. This last slide is Hildegard's mandala-like vision of choruses of angels surrounding God. God is depicted as a white space, signifying that the divine cannot be captured by an image. We will never know if Hildegard was seeing visions of angels in heaven that were given to her by God, or if there's another explanation for what she saw. In today's medicine, Hildegard might be diagnosed as having migraine headaches or physical or mental health concerns. We don't know why she had these visions, why she was so driven and passionate about things, but we do know that her music has brought great joy and inspiration to many souls over the last eight centuries. We know that her writings give us hope and make us feel connected with each other and with the earth. Hildegard was a prophetic voice and a model for what it means to use our six sources to live a life making meaning, seeking and embracing art and music and creativity. We could do worse than to follow most of her words, but not all of them. And our hearts will know when something resonates with our core values with goodness and beauty and truth, and our hearts will know when something is not coming from a place of love. 
thank you for journeying with me on this exploration of Hildegard today. And I would invite you to look into her artwork and especially her music. She was so special that she had, still has many fans. Actually, I did the math, it's 900 years later. Blessed be and may it be so. Thanks, Jenny, for introducing us to, or reacquainting us with, Hildegard. What a woman she was. So next week, our Pulpa guest will be Janet Newton Thibodeau, otherwise known as Carl Newton's daughter. Having grown up in the church, Janet is now the minister at the First Parish Church of Berlin in Massachusetts, where she continues to honor and to celebrate the sacred spark that lives within us all. While the Delta variant rages on, the church will remain closed to in-person services, as well as for the coffee hour. We will continue to gather through the online magic of YouTube and Zoom brought to us by our fabulous AV technicians. Longtime church member Joyce Nichols is downsizing before moving to new digs. She would like to invite anyone who is interested in providing a new home for the things she cannot move to stop by this afternoon between 1130 and 6 at her old home at 505 Oppenheimer Place, number 1202. Anything left in her place should be considered fair game. You are welcome to leave a donation for the church if you choose or if you deem it appropriate. And please wear a mask. If this is your first time with us, we invite you to sign our virtual guest book. And everyone is reminded that you can submit personal joys and sorrows for our virtual candle lighting as well. Since Reverend John will be on sabbatical until November 1st, we invite you to send your questions and comments to Susanna No in our church office. The link for doing all these things are in the service notes below this video. For information on upcoming events and other ways to connect, check our Facebook pages as well as our website. And thanks for being with us. We hope to see you next week online. Our offering gives us a chance to share some of the gifts that we have received with the wider world. During the month of September, 100% of our offering will be accepted on the behalf of Lutheran Family Services in support of their program to assist refugees and asylum seekers. Lutheran Family Services provide a wide range of resettlement resources, school supplies, clothing, housing, and employment opportunity. And remember, Afghan refugees are now arriving, so the needs are even greater. Please use the Givelify app on your mobile devices or the link in the service notes below. Thank you for your generosity, and may what you give bring you joy, as well as connection with the wider world. May peace and contentment be yours this week.
My friends, as I leave you today, thank you for coming with me on this journey. And I hope that you found something to take away with you into your week. Let us heed the prophetic words of Hildegard and look for the great and fiery force that sparkles in everything that lives. As we leave her story today, may we look and listen and be present to revelation. What is nature telling us? Are we listening for prophetic voices? Are we present to the never-ending magic and beauty that await our gaze and our listening? We have many sources of our faith that we can draw inspiration and wisdom from, even when the sources are people who aren't perfect. I have faith that revelation and joy and connection with the divine are right here, waiting for us to notice. All we have to do is keep our hearts open, which isn't an easy task, actually. But I invite you to take the story with you of Hildegard with you into your week and let her remind you that none of us is perfect and none of us has all the answers. At the same time, may she inspire you with the reminder that amongst all the suffering and injustice of this world, there is love, there is beauty, and there is hope. As we leave this sacred space together, let us gather up all the love and joy that has been offered to feed our souls in our togetherness and hold each other close. Then let us send it out to each other. Go in peace and look for joy. Amen.